Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you this morning. Won't you stand? We're going to go straight into glorifying God. this morning, Jesus. For glory to your name, God.
Church, we've been singing about lifting up God's name and exalting Him for His goodness and His kindness to us. And I'm so mindful of the fact that even as we stand in this building today, we're all facing our own challenges. We're facing things head on. We've been avoiding things and they've come to the front of, or to the surface now. And I'm just mindful sometimes it's hard to admit the fact that I don't know where else to look. I don't know what else to do. And I wanted to remind us of a verse, and I say us because I'm reminded as well, of a verse in Hebrews 12, which says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter and author of our faith. And I don't know about you, maybe, yeah, you can clap hands for that. It's true. God is the author and perfecter of our faith. And maybe today you're going, well, I don't have faith. Or maybe my faith, Leandri, is really like, whoo, sweeping it under the rug kind of thing. Or can we be honest this morning and say that we're all on a journey? And God invites each and every one of us to that journey, to walk the journey alongside Him. And so even if this is your very first time today, you've never been in church before, or maybe it's the first time in a really long time that you've been in church, can I remind you that God's heart's desire is to have a conversation with you this morning. And I want to invite you, if, if you'd be brave enough to say, Hey, Leandri, I've, I've got a prayer need this morning, and I'd love you to pray for it. And again, I'll say it. My hand is raised. I have huge prayer needs. And I want to invite you right now, if, if there's someone who wants prayer, can I ask you to show that by your hand just so that I know who I'm praying for? And there's hands going up right across this place. And as I say to you, even if it's your very first time today, you don't need to be afraid of saying, hey, I'd like prayer. God wants to speak to each of you. And as I pray, can I invite you to bring that prayer need to God? God, I need strength. God, I need you to come through. Nothing else is going to make it. You're the only thing that's going to change things. Father, right now I lift up each and every prayer need of those that's hands are raised, God, here and at home. And we thank you, God, that you are in control, that you are a faithful God, that you're a consistent God, that despite our circumstances, Despite the changes, despite the heartache, despite the anxiety, God, you are our strength. That you don't fall off your throne. You're not afraid of dealing with circumstances or even meeting with us when we've been absolutely silent. So right across this place, God, as we lift our needs to you, God, I ask that you would do what only you can do. And Father, your word speaks about receiving a peace, a peace like no other. So God, I pray that peace right now over each and every person that despite their circumstances, despite their anxiety, despite their concerns, God, there would be a peace that they would be able to recognize that it can only be you. And so for that, God, we thank you that you are a loving God, you are a good God, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can clap. Yes, it is fantastic to be in God's house. And a very, very good morning to each and every one of you. If you are visiting us for the very first time today, we are so glad that you've decided to join us. We hope that you feel welcome. And if you're visiting us online for the first time, hello to you. It's so good that you've decided to join us too. I want to invite you as Abby says hello as well. Why don't you guys turn around and say hello to someone. Maybe you've never seen them before. Be intentional and say hi. It's nice to meet you. It is so good to have so many people in church. You guys can grab your seats. And this Sunday is a special Sunday. It is Child Blessing Sunday, and we are so, so excited. And Daniel's going to take us into that. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me check this time. Okay, it wasn't me this time. <laughs> in the first service, I forgot to unmute. Uh, But a very, very warm welcome. Today is indeed a very special day in the life of our church. This is something that is very important to us. Uh, We hold high value when it comes to child blessing. Um, Because we know the mandate and we know what God's Word says about the next generation. And we've seen in Scripture how Jesus blesses. And I was just reminded of the very verse that God gave to us as a church regarding this and why we do this. Um, Psalm 78, it says, We will not hide these truths from our children, for we will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty 
wonders. We will tell the next generation, and this is why child bless is important, why parents come and they say, we take an opportunity, why our leadership and our elders come around and we pray for these families. Because we know, we've seen in Scripture how people would bring their children before, before elders, before the temple, and they would pray, and they would first, it would be a thanksgiving to God for the life of their children, but then also to pray for a blessing to be upon their children. And I know as a parent, you need all the blessing you can get when raising a children, and you want the blessing on your children. And I said to the, 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 um, those that are in this service, as we spoke last week, um, and I said, do you know what? Just come as you are. Baby screaming, da, da, da. It's fine. We're family. We're used to this. This is normal. But throughout Scripture, we saw how people would bring their children for a blessing. We see how Hannah brought Samuel in, in 1 Samuel 1. She brought and said, ask God for a blessing upon his life. Mary, the mother of Jesus, you read in Luke 2, verse 22, it says, When Jesus was presented at the temple to all the people of faith, they both held him and they prayed a blessing over him. And we know the heart of our Father. We know how Jesus loves children, how it's always been his passion. He was a child magnet. The disciples had to pull the kids off Jesus. Why are we reading scripture in Mark 10? How he rebuked his disciples and he said, let the children come to me so I can bless them. And he took them into his arms. Because the disciples are like, come Jesus, we need you to move. We need you to keep going. And he went, no. The heart of our Father, love for children. He loves children. And that's why as a church, we hold on to that. We know the mission what God's called us to love God and love people. We love our kids. And God loves them even more. And so we take this opportunity where families come and then in a moment they're going to come onto stage. Uh, our leadership team is going to come and stand around and we're going to pray a blessing of God onto them. So I'm going to invite Joe and the rest of the team and the families that are getting blessed to come onto stage. And each church, let's give them a round of applause as they make their way up. We've got kids coming from the back, all over the place. And we're going to welcome them onto stage. It's family, it's busy, we love it. My favorite are the outfits that they get to wear today. <laughs> Here we go. Cute. And our leadership team is here on stage. And I want to encourage you because the reality is many people that don't usually come to each church, and we're so glad that you're here. And I don't want this moment just to be to spectate. I want to encourage you, those that are seated here, these are your family and friends that are on stage, that you pray a blessing over them. Take the photos, do all of that stuff. We love it. But pray intentionally for them. Don't just make this an opportunity where you watch us praying. We want you to intentionally pray because this is a spirit family. We're all connected with each other. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to take a moment to pray right now. And so I'm going to ask our leadership team to come around and we're going to pray a blessing and favor on these families.
pray intentionally for our, our children. And then I'm going to ask after that, Jo, who's our community life pastor, she's going to take a moment to pray for our parents. They need as much prayer as possible. And so I'm going to ask <laughs> Neandri just to pray for these little lives here on stage. Father, we thank you, God, for these little lives. And I want to invite you, if you feel comfortable, you can just raise your hand out. It's just a sign of saying, hey, we want to pray for these kids. We are believing for God's best in their lives. And so, God, we lift up these kids to you right now. We thank you for Sean and for Leah and for Abigail, Imichle, Alana, Noah. We thank you for them, God. And we pray your richest blessing over them, Lord, as we lift them up to you now, God. We thank you that it's by no mistake that they are here, God. And we pray your richest blessing over them. God, would you line their paths with people that have wisdom, that give them courage, that give them strength, that would remind them of the truth, that they are so deeply loved by you and that you have a plan for their lives. And God, I pray right now, yeah, that you would just shower them and shower them and shower them with your blessing and anointing, God. Bless them, we pray. We thank you for them. I bring before you these parents. I thank you for Lazal. I thank you for DC and Luwabo. I thank you for Yvette and Reginald. I thank you for Nicholas and Robin. And I bring them before you and I say, Father God, bless them, protect them, give them wisdom. Father God, I pray that they would know that there's others on the journey with them that can help them because we need all the help that we can get to parent these children. And so I thank you that as, as a body, we can come before you and bring these parents to you. And we thank you for that in your name. Amen. Amen. And God's people say together. Amen. Amen. Gifts. So we'd love to gift each and every one of them with a special gift. So we're going to hand those out quickly. Here's this one, yeah? No, 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 that's what you're in. Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe we should. So now it's just, yeah, three children, one. Uh, one. <laughs> when your family gets bigger to try and make plans. Anyone else struggle with calendars is just Daniel and I. Obviously, just us, love. It's only us. Oh, this is awkward. No, but as you know, our lives are so full and as restrictions start to lift, things get busy. And so we're excited about the fact that Edge News is one of the ways that we can find out what's happening in the busy life of our church. So why don't you take a look? and here's what's happening in the life of our church. Teenagers, Elevate is opening doors this week. We cannot wait to see you in person. If you are in grades 7 to 12, make sure to sign up on the Church Center app or follow the link on Elevate's Instagram. Don't forget to spread the word and invite your worlds. See you on Friday at 7 p.m. Take your next step in your journey with God by getting baptized. This step of obedience declares your love for God publicly. Our next Baptism Sunday is the 10th of October. Sign up and join us this Tuesday at 7 p.m. to prepare. We love that our church is all about loving God and loving people. Here's Pastor Daniel to share with us. What an incredible journey God has had us in the past year as a church. And God has really moved us to explore more ways in which we can demonstrate His love in practical ways. And one of the ways we love on people is how they experience church. When people park their cars, they check in their kids, find a seat, connect as a guest, grab a coffee, enjoy something to eat. We want to create welcoming spaces where people feel careful, they feel comfortable, and ultimately discover their next step with Jesus. 
And I love how 1 Peter 4 talks about how we are to offer hospitality to one another, using our gifts to serve one another. Romans says it speaks about being inventive in our hospitality. And so I'm excited because on Sunday, the 3rd of October, whether you've been serving in service ministry or not, if you're keen to join us and explore what we are going to do, how we're going to plan for hosting hospitality and creating more of this culture of love, I encourage you to join us. I'm going to be sharing the vision and the heart for this area of ministry. And together, we'll create new innovations to show God's love to guests, friends, and family. I encourage you. If you have a passion for how we host others in and around our building, join us on Sunday, the 3rd of October at 5.30. Thanks for sharing your heart, Pastor Daniel. So save the date at the 3rd of October and join us at 5.30 p.m. in person. You can register via our website or church center app. Today is the first Sunday of Uncomplicated Family, and we've got some great things coming up. On Sunday, the 17th of October, Dr. Genevieve De Silva joins us as our guest speaker. Jen is an educational psychologist. She's married to Ray. Together, they are raising three boys and lead Bridge Church, Port Alfred. Jen has a heart for families, helping them understand the intricate dynamics and developing strategies towards healthy function. She aims to equip parents in their task of raising the next generation. We are blessed to have Genevieve join us. So save the date, invite a friend as we chat all things family. And send us a WhatsApp if you've got questions for us to include in our conversation with Jen. And next week, our hearts are expectant as Jason Render joins us as our guest speaker. Jason and Sue lead View Church Moniton and they are truly friends of our Edge Church family. Jason loves deeply and it's evident in how he lives his life as a husband, father, friend and pastor. Jason will be sharing all things blended, mended and extended as we continue to explore uncomplicated families. We'll also spend time breaking bread together. I'm Samane and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you, Samane. Samane is also on keys this morning, so thank you, Samane. Woohoo! <laughs> Well, my giving verse comes from Psalm 78, verse 5 to 6, and it says this. For he issued his laws to Jacob, and he gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. And the whole chapter, chapter 78, is actually written to the people of God, so you and I. And these verses remind us of a mandate, a calling on our lives as God's people, that it's our responsibility. It's a calling that God's given us, an instruction to pass on God's teaching to the next generation, that we would teach them about God's goodness and faithfulness so that they too can fall madly in love with Jesus and be able to tell the next generation. And church, this, this verse falls beautifully in line with the fact that we have child blessing today because I'm so reminded of the fact that we're literally one generation away. The Christian faith is one generation away from being extinct. We're in a pandemic where it's not the norm to come to church on a Sunday anymore. It is our responsibility, it's our calling, it's a mandate on our lives to go and remind the next generation about God's goodness and faithfulness. And not only that, that when turmoil strikes, when struggles happen, when there are bad things that happen because we're going to hear about them, it's guaranteed we're all going to struggle, that they would have the hope of God in their lives and be able to pass that on to the next generation. See, the very reason we do what we do, the very reason we have child blessing, the very reason why Edge Church is big on little people is because we believe that every person, no matter how big or small, every person deserves to know the facts, the truth, that A, God is madly in love with them, and B, He has a plan for their lives. And that's, that's a message that we make sure we teach at Edge Kids week in and week out. Why? Because we want the message to be loud and clear that God chooses them every single day. So today as you give, may it actually be out of an understanding that you're actually being called to be a part of something far bigger than yourself, that you've actually been called to to take on the calling, take on the opportunity to be part of teaching the next generation about God's goodness and kindness. So thank you to you as you give, and I'd love to spend a moment just praying. 
Father, I thank you that we have the crazy, awesome opportunity to be able to tell the next generation about your goodness and kindness. And God, sometimes that's such a scary thought that I have this responsibility. But I thank you that the way we teach the next generation about your love, your goodness, and your kindness, it's just through the way that we love one another, the way we spend time together, and the way that we live out our lives. And so God, I do pray that you'd give us the strength to do that to the best of our ability that we would be kind to ourselves when we mess up, because we do, and that, God, we would truly bring honor and glory to your name, that we take on that calling, that we're called to first, A, love you and love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sunday again to every single one of you. Don't you think that music we just played sounds like a carnival? <laughs> I was like, it's the best description of family music that you can possibly get. Well, it's really good to be with you, and it's good to see so many faces again, being able to connect with those that I haven't seen for a while. So it's good to have you all here this morning, and then looking directly at our camera, those are with us live now. Welcome to Edge Church. It is so good to have you. Why don't we give all those that are first time here a big warm Warm welcome. It is good, good, good that you're in God's house this morning. And I'm really excited for where we're going because we, we shifted to focusing now on family. And over the next few weeks, it's going to be encouraging and also challenging, I believe, as we unpack this very topic of uncomplicated family. I said it when I asked who's next week here, we got Jason Render bringing God's word on blended men and extended. And he said to me, and your series is called Uncomplicated Family. <laughs> I said, yes, he's like, it's impossible. It doesn't exist. So I said, well, that's where, why we're bringing it in. So I want to encourage you, don't miss next week. And then in two weeks' time, we have Dr. Genevieve De Silva. It's been incredible to just connect to her and hear her heart when it comes to um, her educational psychology degree, but then also how you implement that with God's perspective in raising family. And so don't miss out. Maybe there's a question and you're like, I feel too embarrassed as a parent to ask us because we've labeled that week, no perfect parents. Yeah. No perfect parent, no perfect parents. And so maybe there's a question, send it to this number. We will gladly keep it discreet and we will be able to answer that. But this morning as we start, and I'm starting week one about this, this of uncomplicated family, and the title of my message today is called Building a Lasting Family. Building a lasting family. And I want to start here in week one. But can I just say that maybe as I said that, you're thinking, well, I don't have kids, and maybe the series is just for parents. For the majority of us, we are all a part of a family. They are brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces and, and cousins and uncles and aunties. We're all part of a family, and there's some form of connection, some form of relationship. And so this series is not just for parents with kids. It's for all of us, because for the majority of us, we are part of a family. And I want to give you, when you look at the dictionary, how the dictionary defines family, it defines family as a group consisting of parents and children living together in a household, or a group of people related biologically or by marriages. And if you look, they define six types of families that we have. We have the nuclear family, we have the single parent families, we have blended families, we have grandparent families, which is big in our culture in South Africa. We have childless families, and we have extended families. And so the dictionary defines like that, but when you look at God's word and you read scripture, scripture speaks about the two types of family. We have our biological family, which is blood family, related, that, that are relatives with us. And then we also have what's called the spirit family. And now the spirit family is when a couple comes together, 
that are not a part of the same blood. They're not related biologically. Let's just make that clear. That's the number one rule. They come together and they get married. Scripture talks about that Jesus says, what God joins, let no man separate. And now they become one by the Spirit. They come as one family. And that makes a family. So, do you know that all of us that are seated here right now, also those on TV with us at the moment, we are all part of a spirit family. Children as well are part of the family with us. This is a shout blessing. It's normal. And we're all part of family because we have one common thing together in this room. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. And so that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul speaks about this in Ephesians 1, verse 5 to 6. So he says, For it's always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus. From the very outset, Jesus' design was that we would be part of a family. That's why he sent his son so that we can belong to a family. And you know, the most beautiful thing is that all families look different. All families are different, and I I love that about it, that we're not all the same little cookie-cutter families. We have our big families. We have small families. We have blended families. We have extended. We have the loud families that are in your face, that are constantly on WhatsApp all the time, talking to you. Those aunties are there with you every step that you take. And then you also have the quiet families, the people that are more reserved, everyone's in their rooms. They're just so gentle and kind to each other. (laughs) Uh, We're the loud family. (laughs) We have family with small little kids. We have families with older, grown kids who have got their own kids. There's grandparents and there's grandkids. And then there's families that there are no kids. But I think what we can all agree upon, every single one of us, because whether you have a family or you're a part of a family, family life can be incredibly complicated. It can be so complicated, and I think the timing of the series, where we positioned it even in our calendar, is so appropriate, because we're approaching the end of the year, the busyness just just picks up now, exams, stress, parents trying to get kids through, it's just like intense at the moment, and then this is where the family WhatsApp group, bless that group, comes into play even more, because we're planning Christmas, (laughs) trying to organize who's going here, what time, who's this, who's bringing what. There's always the one family member that says, you can use my house, but then you never go there. And so we have this opportunity now, and it just becomes busy and busy and becomes, let's say, complicated. But I think we can agree, and something that has really stood out is that in this century, the 21st century, what families face and challenges face are like no one other generation has faced. There are complications and challenges that have come our way that we face as families in this century. So what was ideally depicted, the ideal little picture, even why we chose, because you know, it's always the two parents, two kids, the dog, and the perfect little house, that's the family. And not a really a cat, it's never in the picture. Um, we have two cats, I'm praying soon we're going to have a dog. But... We look at this and we depict that as the family, but what has happened between expectations and we build up this expectation to to verse what reality is can be worlds apart. And many, what we are facing today are demands and challenges that, like I said, in this 21st century is more evident than ever before. We have this dynamic of both parents having to work. And so you have this work and family balance that is constantly competing and the guilt that comes with us parenting about, am I giving enough time? But we still need to make ends meet. We we have an unemployment rate that is so high. We have kids that are having to return home because they don't have jobs. And so it's feeding the cycle of things have changed when kids are supposed to be looking after parents, it's going the other way. We have the demand of, of, of screen time that has gripped us. And it starts from a young age. They want to be in front of a tablet or in front of a phone, and we have to constantly compete with social media and cyberbullying that's taking place. We have emotional demands on a family unit where young kids are struggling with anxiety and depression. And there's all of this stuff that's happening, these demands, and there's this comparison game that we get caught up so easily 
what school does your child go to? Oh no, mine goes to, yeah, what did, how do they do their grades? And we're keeping up with the Joneses all the time. We have to just keep up the parents. Best family holiday ever, all on Instagram, but meanwhile they're crying because it's on the credit card. <laughs> We've all been there. And these are the demands and pressures that are facing it. And what is it leading to? Complications within family units. And so often what we've experienced and what I'm seeing and connecting with families, connecting pastorally, but also just being ourselves raised in a family is that the priority order has changed. The value system of families have changed as time has gone on. And what we are seeing is working out is that the priority order and the value system is that number one, is money. Number two is your social status, your position in society, whether it's pursuing the higher level in your job career or within the suburb or in what your pretenses are with people. And then number three, that's where family comes in. And this is a lot of us that are finding ourselves in this position because we think that if I have enough money and a better social position or status at work, I will be able to provide for my family everything that they need. And so the thought process keeps on going. I need to work harder, get a position, better position, a better suburb to live in. And then my family will understand because I'm going to give them everything that they want. And then they will come third in the order. There's nothing wrong, please hear me. There's nothing wrong with wanting the best for your family. I want the best for my family. I want the best for my daughter. I want to be able to give her the best that what we can give. There's nothing wrong with that. But to what extent do we go in changing the priority order in building lasting families? What are the unintended consequences of when we put money first, when we put our social status first, and then we put our family? What are the consequences that are going to be left with our family? And this is what the series is all about, that we need to come back to our source. Our quote that we're going to carry throughout the season says, in order for families to work. Let the one who designed them define them. Why I started with this, the the definition of the dictionary, but then God speaks about family as well. Let him define what families should look like. And how does he do that? How do we hear him? We have to, Matthew 6, 33, our anchor verse for this series is seek the kingdom of God above all else. Above your job, above finances, above which is the best school, above suburbs, seek God first and then note what you'll do. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Everything your children need, everything your family members need. Seek God. And that's my prayer for us as we start this series. Those that are here this morning online, then my prayer is that we would seek God and in doing that, we would trust Him in everything that we desire and God knows the desires of our hearts for our family and for our loved ones. I know for myself personally, myself and Leandri, we are a young family and, and we constantly learning and constantly failing in raising our family. We don't get it right and sometimes we get it right and sometimes wrong and, and it's just this thing that happens But can I tell you that something that has been modeled to me personally, growing up, has always been God first and then family. I've experienced it. I've been a part of it. I have witnessed it. It's not just nice things that I need to say for a sermon. I've grown up in this culture of that it's always God first in the household and family and then everything else. Now, Are we a perfect family? Not at all, not even close to it. Do we fight? Yes. Are we in each other's faces? Yes. Do we stress about money and finances and cars and moving? And yes. It's not just bliss and peaceful and everything is just great. But there is a foundation. There's an inheritance that I have received in growing up. But can I tell you? And the reason why I'm going there, can I tell you that, that this was a decision. It was a choice. There was intentionality that took place from my parents to build a family like this. It didn't just happen. There was an intention. There was choice that needed to take place, particularly for my mom. There was a decision she needed to make because of her upbringing 
was very different to what I've experienced. And this morning, it really is my honor to be able to invite her on to say to share her story. And we've known her as a pastor for many years. But today, she's going to share a little bit about her journey of growing up and how it relates to this. Thanks, Pastor Dan. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> and Mom. <laughs> oh. I'm the second eldest child of seven children, four boys, three girls in our family. I was raised in Woodstock. Mum was a stay-at-home mum and dad worked in the harbour. My mum and dad were not religious people. We didn't pray together as a family ever. Uh, neither did we go to church together as a family. I don't think we even had a Bible in our home. Yet they would send us off to Sunday school each week with a small offering, a small money offering, which we dutifully spent at the corner cafe on our way to Sunday school. Every (laughs) single Sunday. We thought it was actually our pocket money. Uh, When I was 13 years old, I tried to commit suicide. I remember after having, waking up in hospital, after having my stomach pump, seeing the principal of my school sitting next to my bedside with a very concerned expression on his face and asking me the question, and my name at the time was Bobby, (laughs) Um, asking me the question, Bobby, why did you try to take your life? What's going on in your world? I could not share with him that I was carrying the deep pain of being sexually abused as a child. This is a secret that I carried with me through all of my childhood and into much of my young adult life. I was at high school when drugs was introduced to our family through my brother. And that began a cycle, and I want to say a cycle, because it was a cycle that I had to break in terms of what was coming through my family. A cycle of pain and destruction and dysfunction. And I think for me, the biggest pain was the disintegration and the fragmentation of my family from that point on. There were many times, many times when we had the cops knocking at the door. Have you ever heard a cop knocking at the door? Maybe not, but it was a part of my, Danny says no, but it was a part of my reality. And that generated a fear and an anxiety and a feeling of vulnerable for a very long time in my life. But it was into that chaos, into that pain, the pain of my world, that God stepped in that he found me, that he arrested me. And that was the start of my most important relationship in my life, my walk and journey with God. It was a church that I met Pedro and we began a relationship. We were very good friends before we discovered that, whoa, there's deeper feelings here. But right at the very start when we made the commitment to, to each other, We also let each other know that we were deeply committed to keeping God first and center of our lives. That was our decision that we were making, that we were dedicating, setting our lives apart to be in service wherever God was going to call us to. And so we were married in 1981, and in 1984, after serving serving several years in Manenburg, which was our first church, we were there for a good number of years, we set off with our firstborn son, Luke, who was just three weeks old, a little baby, in our vehicle to go and work in northeastern Namibia, right on the Angolan border, working amongst an unreached group of people, living amongst them, known as the Humbukushu. For those 10 years on the mission field, I had lost contact with my siblings, although I had contact with my mum and with my younger sister. We returned to Cape Town in 1992 to serve as pastors at the then Edgemead Assembly of God Church, currently Edge Church, this beautiful church that we are part of, and family. And we were now a family of five with our sons, Joel, Joel, who's going to be leaving in a week's time for Bloemfontein to take up a post as a a deputy head at Gray's College. And with Daniel, our youngest son, making up this beautiful family of five. When we got back to Cape Town, as I said, I made contact with my family and really it saddened me. 
as it became so apparent to me, because now I was in the cold face of it, to see how they were living a lifestyle where God wasn't a part of their lives, where he never featured in their lives, wasn't part of their families at all. And I got to see, as an adult now, I'd experienced it as a child, but as an, an older child with my own family unit, I got to see how through their choices and decisions that they made, how drugs and crime and imprisonment, incarceration, and even a, dr a drug-related drive-by shooting that took the life of my sister-in-law, who was a mum of three very young children. It broke my heart. I was broken, seeing how their lives were decimated, seeing their brokenness and their lostness and the, and the ugliness of what drugs had done to their lives, the hopelessness. I was broken. My heart broke. And I carried this with me for a very, very long time. It was during this time there was a significant, I call it a touchstone moment, a pivotal moment, a hinge moment, call it what you like, which was birthed out of the heartache that I felt for my family of origin, my mum, my dad, and my siblings. Pedro and I had taken a drive down to the Milneton Lagoon, and holding hands on the wooden bridge, you go there now, you think, what wooden bridge is Barbie? Well, but that was before the earth crust hardened. We stood on the wooden bridge, and we took some time to pray. And there again, which we did multiple times and will continue to do, we recommitted our lives afresh to God, asking Him that He would always be first, and that we would seek to raise our family with God at the center. It is in that space, I call it a sacred, holy space, a defining moment that we prayed for our boys who were just little. We prayed for our children, that none of the things that had happened in my family of origin, in our families, because it's generation to generation, would be passed on to them and carried over because it just goes into the next generation. Those prayers forever impacted the trajectory of my immediate family, my sons, my daughters-in-law, my granddaughters. And we've seen over the many years till today, and we believe it for the future, how God has carried us, how that day he heard our prayers, and how that day he began a work of healing. That prayer and that cry mm. on that wooden bridge was also the beginning of the process of my own healing from the trauma of my early childhood. I can remember ringing in my ears this little saying, what's not transformed, we transmit. What's not, when we don't do the hard work of restoration, dealing with the past, letting go of the past, um, dealing with the thing of unforgiveness, we transmit it to the next generation. So as a result of that, moment, making that decision, choosing to keep God at the center and the source of our very breath and the source of how we were going to raise our children. Out of that grew a deep compassion and a love even for my own siblings. There was such a disconnect, but God was doing something there, restoring, rebirthing something inside of me today. Pedro and I pray regularly for them, if not every day, are they in my mind and in my thoughts. One of the results that came out of this prayer that we pray for our, my family and our family is that we had the joy of leading my older brother, the one who brought drugs into the family that decimated the family, my family of origin. We had the privilege of leading him to Jesus Christ where he made a decision that changed his life in the final moments of his life. And we had the privilege of conducting his funeral where his family were present. Thank you, Dan. There was a decision, a choice, that was made <clears throat> to build a lasting family. And I can I tell you, because of that, because of the decision my mom and dad made, I didn't have to inherit that pain. It wasn't transmitted to me. Were we perfect? Not at all. 
but she didn't pass on that inheritance to me. And because of that choice that she made, because of the choice that my dad made, I am the byproduct now of those choices. And that with my family now, with my daughter, there's a foundation in which I can build on, a foundation that has been set before me to build my family. And you know, God's word speaks about this very principle about foundations. And it's about the parable when Jesus speaks in, in Matthew 7 and he's talking to a crowd and he says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Yeah. And the rain descends, the floods come, the winds blow and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, they'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descends, the floods come, the winds blow and beat that house and it fell and great was its fall. And you look at that verse, you listen to that parable that Jesus was talking about, the two men that built the house, one the wine on rock and one on the sands. There are three promises that Jesus gave that I want to share with you today. Three promises. That, number one, Jesus promises to us as we build a lasting family that there will be serious difficulties in all our lives. In every one of our lives, as, we, as we're in a family, as we're part of a family, as we're raising families, as we've got older kids, grandkids, there will be challenges that come our way. We live in a world that is now of COVID, of a, a pandemic that has happened, but not just of that, but of depression and anxiety. We live in a world where our economic recession, it's so great. There's so many uncertainties. There's this toying of, do we immigrate or don't we? Do we stay? We live in a world, and when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, I'm telling you, you need to build a house. And I'm telling you up front already that there are going to be troubles that you face. There are going to be things that are going to come your way, and I'm telling you, so that you're not disappointed in life. Expectation versus reality. I'm telling you that this is going to come your way. And he's saying, on what foundation are you building your lives and your family? And the thing is, wise builders build for the worst case scenario that can happen. You see, your house is only as strong as your foundation. So if you're building only in the good times, you're setting yourself up for failure. Because every one of us are going to face the storms of life. The second thing that Jesus promises to us, that he promises total security and courage to those who obey his word. He doesn't promise that everything is going to be great because you might be here and you're like, but I did raise my kids in the ways of the Lord. I did put God first, but they've gone astray. They're not serving God or things have happened. Courage, Jesus promises us. Whoever hears his saying of mine and does them, not just hearers, but doers, they are the wise man who built on the rock. The third promise that Jesus says to us, which is also a warning. Number three is Jesus promises failure to every person and family who disobeys his word. And you think, oh, this is a harsh thing to put up, child blessing service. This is the word of God. It's not me just trying to make up things. Listen, it says that Jesus says this, that everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains descends, the floods come, the winds blow and beat on the house and it fell and it was a great fall. I've been with families, I meet with families that have experienced the heartache of a breakdown in family relationships. And please hear me, I'm not saying that we're better than anyone else or if we've got a perfect, please, so often I can find myself building my family on sand. My relationship can be built so quickly on sand. I'm not at all saying that we have it right. We all go there. And this is why Jesus says these very commands of what are you building your foundation? What are you building your life upon? And you think to myself, but it's obvious. Who would want to build on sand? Who would really want to do that? We all do. Can I tell you why? Because number one, it's more comfortable on sand. 
It really is. Especially in a world that we live in today, it's not anti, it's not a non-biblical world, it's actually an anti-biblical world. And so this whole thing, it's more comfortable to be in the world than to follow the ways of what God has called. But secondly, it's more popular to be on the sand. You go to the beach, where do you see the people? On the sand. They're only on the rocks if they come from the UK, but they go onto the sand. It's more comfortable there. It's more popular to be there. In our culture today, the popular place is to not be in the Word of God. Another reason why we build on the sand is that sand is conformable to us. You lay on sand and you get up, you can see your body imprint. Some are larger, some are smaller when they get up. (laughs) But your body imprint is there. You lay on the rock, you look like the rock when you get up. It's conformable to us. And what we like to do is just conform with what's popular, what's next, let's do this. Oh, Sundays we do that. Oh, don't worry about church. We just conform to where the world's going, and yet Jesus calls us to not conform to the world. And God calls us to build our lives on this rock. So what are some of the principles that I want to share as I come to wrap this up? Just four truths that I want to share with you today as we build lasting families. And I'm not saying we get this always right. I'll be the first one to put my hand to say I fail all the time. This is no perfect families here. Number one is that we're called to surrender our lives and our family to the Lordship of Jesus and His Word. You see, I know for many of us that we know Jesus, and maybe you don't. And in a moment in the service, I'm going to give you that opportunity to make the best decision ever. But I want to ask those who know Jesus, who made that decision, like, you know, I'm going to heaven and all of that. Can I, can I really ask you this question? And I want you to reflect on it. Is Jesus really the Lord of your family? Think about it. Leona and I made a decision right from the very beginning, and we try hard with this, and, we, and like I said, we get it wrong at times, but we really try hard at this, is that the Bible is the final authority in our household. That it's not about whose decision is better, or if that sounds cool, or that, and then it's like, what does the Word of God say about this? What does God's word say about that? Because God doesn't, he doesn't necessarily bless good decision. He blesses his decision. He doesn't bless good ideas. He blesses his ideas. So the word of God is the final decision. But then secondly, is that we pray first. We pray first about everything. Now, that was a culture that I grew up in. And so when I was introduced and Leander and I connected, she prayed, she loved God. But praying about everything, it was weird for her. She used to get irritated with me. I used to say, let's just take a moment to pray about this quickly. And she'd be like, oh, for goodness sakes. (laughs) Pray first. Because can I tell you, the Bible is not going to tell you about when to buy a car, where to go, what school to put your child in, what policy to take. Do you leave this job to take that one? It's not going to tell you all of those details. It gives you principles. And so we need God's wisdom in making decisions that impact our families. We need decisions in how we relate to our parents, to our siblings around us. We pray first. Because we are called sheep. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on himself the sins of us all. You know, this analogy of sheep is often used and it's depicted about us all the time. Jesus describes us as sheep. And can I just say it's not a compliment? Because sheep are actually pathetic. They are freck cute. Don't get me wrong. It's Leandri's favorite animal. But they are pathetic. They need constant guidance and someone to help them. Think about it. They cannot navigate for themselves. Have you ever seen a honing sheep? They cannot defend themselves. Ever seen a sheep attack someone? (laughs) Yeah, they might bite you, but they're actually... And we describe like that because you see, we are like sheep. Sheep need shepherds. We need Jesus, the Lord of our life and our family. We need him because when Jesus looks down from heaven and he sees us as a family and he sees us trying to navigate this in the midst of wolves that are all around us, in the midst of demands and social pressure and emotional pressure and all these things, he's saying, you need a shepherd. You need me to help navigate your family. And he commands us to call out to him and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. Can I say that I love being a dad to Rachel? It's the highlight of my life to be her dad. 
And I think what would break my heart more than anything is that if she came to a place where she says she doesn't need me or doesn't want me anymore. And I tell you, the heart of our Father is even more than what I feel about this. All that He desires is that you would want Him. When He calls us sheep, all that He wants to do is to be your shepherd, to guide you, to be able to come to that place and say, God, I'm here. Psalm 23 describes this life of someone who has submitted their life to the Lordship and His Word. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He, he leads me besides peaceful streams. He renews my strength. Another translation says he restores my soul. He guides me along the right path, bringing honor to name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, even when family tragedy comes, even when there's unemployment, even when there's depression and anxiety, even when there is trauma that has happened, he says, I am with you in that moment. I will not be afraid. For you're close beside me, my shepherd. Your rod and your star protect and comfort me. Psalm 23 is an accurate description of someone who has surrendered their life to the lordship and the authority of God's word on their family. Second principle that we see is that we need to think, if we're going to build a lasting family, we need to think about the generational effects of your behavior and plan accordingly. We heard the story of my mom. There could have been a very different generational impact that happened to us that I could have passed on to my daughter. Proverbs 13, 22, it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. We have to be intentional. It's a choice that we need to make. Question I ask you, what are your children seeing? What has been modeled to your family? Are you modeling that Jesus is first? Are you modeling that God is the center of your life? As church just become on a Sunday, don't worry, we'll catch up with it later. Let's do this. Or is it still a priority? What are we modeling? What is the generational impact? Number three, keep your family in a life-giving church where they can be grounded spiritually and build strong relationships. Please, this is not like a marketing ploy that I'm trying to promote each church here. There are many life-giving churches in our community that we have great relationship with, and I will recommend them in a heartbeat to you because they're life-giving. And I, but my heart and my desire for us, you want to build a lasting family, is that you keep your family in a life-giving church. That Sundays are a commitment. Sundays are a day that we gather together because Hebrews talks about this. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, what we are doing right now as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. When they talk about the day approaching, it's talking about the end times. We need to gather more and more and more. It needs to be more important than ever before. We thought that pre-COVID, we used to do this. You know what's happened? I think for a lot of us, and I respect the restrictions that we follow that, and we are very cautious, and we are so, this is not a fake thing. We know exactly of the real impact that COVID has had. But can I just say, I think for a lot of us, we're using that as an excuse now why we don't gather anymore. It's just COVID, you know, and 18 months have passed and we've actually lost. And can I tell you, the generational impact will play out in its course and we are called to change it. I know for myself, this is where I found God, where my relationship started. It was a life-giving church. Were there times I didn't want to come? Yes. This is where I met Leandri. It's where my daughter loves coming. Last week, Monday, we, we do our normal, well, we try and get it right to pray every time at supper. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's just like, just eat two kids. Just eat, please. <laughs> you know, those moments. And the team can join me. But on Monday, she prayed a prayer, which was, which the normal standard one goes. It's thank you, God, for mommy and daddy. And if her eyes are opened, it just gets extended longer. Mommy and and daddy and mommy and daddy. And, you know, they get, like, stuck. Okay, and next. Thank you for all my friends. And she says, thank you for loving me. And then she said something that she she hasn't said before in a prayer. And she said, thank you for my edge kids. She loves it. She loves her leaders. She loves her leaders. She talks about Bella. She talks about Abby. She loves her leaders. 
There's a generally, generational impact that is happening. Keep your family in a life-giving church. And this is the last one that I want to end with. And it's a story about Dr. Edith Eager. And Edith Eager was, at the age, as a teenager in 1944, she experienced one of the worst evils the human race has ever known. She and her family were sent to Auschwitz, where she saw her parents go to the gas chambers and never saw them again. But her bravery kept her and her sister alive. And at the end of the war on the May 4th, 1945, a young American soldier saw a pile of bodies and she said, they saw a hand moving and it was Edith. Her book, she writes how she, they brought her on the brink of death. She had death upon her. In 1945, she moved to the United States where she went on to go and get her degree in psychology. And then further on, she got her doctorate. And she wrote a book called The Choice. How she mentions that, that there's a choice that needs to take place. A decision she needed to make to overcome the trauma, the sorrow, the pain that she had experienced. How she had to make a choice to change that if she wanted to do, grow her family. And how there was intentionality that she did and took place. Ask the question, how do you rebuild your life after all that trauma? How do you rebuild? How do you go? How do you say, I'm going to do this differently? What upbringing? What did she experience? How do you rebuild? And she says this, and this is my last point that I want to leave with us today. Number point four, building lasting families, you have to choose hope. In her book called The Choice, she says you need to choose hope. We heard from the parables of, of the wise and the fool builders. We heard from the story of my own mom, Edith's story. You see, the reason why I wanted stories is so that you would hear that others have done it. It's been modeled out to us. You need to choose hope. Even if you have a child that you're going, God, I don't know what's going on. Even if you're in a space, in a family unit, and you're thinking, I don't know how. You're looking at your siblings. You're looking at your parents. You're looking at the family dynamics. You're thinking, God, how? You have to choose hope. You see, because hope fuels change and it gives us a better future. Jesus knew that we would experience troubles and that's why he said in John, he said, in this world you'll face many troubles. You will face troubles, he knew it. So what do we do when we build in and build in for a lasting family? You choose hope and the hope is in Jesus. He is our source and He is our hope. Romans 5.13, it says, Now may God, the fountain of hope, fill you with overflowing, with unconditional joy and perfect peace as you trust in Him. You see, because hope allows you to, to live in the present and to trust for the future and not live in the past. Choosing hope for your family, saying, well, even the odds are against us. Choosing hope is saying, I don't have the answer. I don't know how to fix my child. Choosing hope is choosing Jesus. And the word that was spoken over us as a church, that I want to speak over you as your pastor, I want to prophetically speak it over you this morning. That you receive it because there's hearts that are aching. I can sense it. That there is this turmoil in your own family choose hope choose Jesus the very verse spoken over our house is Proverbs 23 18 and all eyes are closed I want you to receive this and if this is, if you're with your family and you feel comfortable maybe like oh this is so cringe now I want you just to hold hands with them and you find yourself in a very challenging place Receive this promise, this word of God over your family. Proverbs 23 says, For your future is bright, and it is filled with a living hope that will never fade. It is filled with a living hope that will never fade. 
fade. People may go, things might happen, things will go happen, and storms of life will come its way. But there's one hope that is a promise that will never fade you. It's the living hope of Jesus. Can I leave you with this one, one truth? You forget everything else. Choose hope for your family. Choose to speak hope over them. And as family units, I want you to say this prayer with me. Just quietly. We're not going to say it out aloud. Just where you are. I want you to say this prayer with me. And mean it from your heart. God, give us wisdom to make the best choices for our family. And give us grace to trust in you even when we don't see the immediate answers. When our hearts are aching, give us grace. Give us hope to carry on in spite of what the circumstances that are around us. And we thank you for hearing our prayers and for answering them. We thank you for your constant care, your constant love over us. We pray for our family that from this day forward, we would build lasting families, that we would choose you, choose hope. And this morning, I want to continue praying maybe for those who have never accepted Jesus. Or even as a family, you see today and you're going, we have drifted so far from God that if you truly ask me, my heart is cold. The most beautiful thing is that God invites you to come home today. And he invites you to come to Jesus. You don't need to do anything. I'm not going to ask you to do anything to embarrass you. All that you need to do is to admit that you need Jesus. And so if that's you saying, Dan, will you pray for me? I want you to just quietly say this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, today I acknowledge that I need you. I need hope. And today I choose you. I recognize that I have drifted, that my heart is cold, that I am not in a relationship with you. And so on this day, this child blessing service, this Sunday that I'm seated here in this building in Edgemead, I choose you. I ask that you forgive me of my past. I ask that you forgive me of the things I've done, the thoughts, the life that I've been living. And today I acknowledge that I need you. So I return to you and say that you are the Lord of my life and I obey you. And if that's you, make this prayer personal and just say these words in whatever. Just say it in your words. Jesus, I need you. I give my life to you. I give my life to you. Father, I thank you for every person who made and said that prayer. And God, I pray that today would be a defining moment for them as they take their next steps in following you. I thank you that it is indeed the best decision. And for us as families, I pray you would give us a confidence to keep showing up, the courage to face what tomorrow holds. Thank you for your grace and your goodness. And all God's people say together, Amen. 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 God bless. Thank you, Pastor Daniel, for that encouraging word. Pastor Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, love. <laughs> well, if you're a guest that has joined us today, as I said to you at the beginning of the service, it is so good that you decided to join us today. And we'd love to put something in your hand that tells you a little bit more about who we are. And we'd love to connect with you outside. So please do join us straight after the service, straight through those doors. You'll see us hanging out there. We'd love to meet you. And on that note, just a reminder about next week's Sunday, we've got Pastor Jason Render bringing an awesome word blended, mended, and extended. It's guaranteed to be very interesting and very encouraging. So I really invite you to come and hang out with us and invite somebody else to join us. It's guaranteed that they would benefit and be deeply encouraged by that. But on that note, God bless you. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday and a wonderful week ahead. Come on, let's stand as we pray God's blessing over us as we're going into our week. Father, now I pray, may the God of peace surround each and every one of us. May His face shine upon us. Be good to us as we go into our week and all God's people say together, Amen. 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 God bless each church. God bless.